Hey, everybody, and welcome back to the Right on Crime podcast. Right on Crime is a national campaign of the Texas Public Policy Foundation that supports conservative solutions for reducing crime, restoring victims, reforming offenders, and lowering taxpayer costs. I'm your host, Britt Allen, and I am so excited to be joined today by a very special guest from the great state of Oklahoma, Right on Crime's regional director, Marilyn Davidson. Hey, Marilyn. Hi, how are you? I'm Good. excited to be here. We're so Texas. excited to have you. I know you're from Oklahoma. Obviously, I'm a Texas girl, and there's a rift there. Are you doing okay since you're in Austin? or? Well, you know, sometimes it's really hard, especially <laughs> when I have to drive by the UT Stadium. Ouch. But then I just remind myself it's actually named after an Oklahoma coach, so <laughs> it makes me feel a little bit better. Um, to all of our uh, Texas listeners <laughs> out there, I'm so sorry. We won't have her back. I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming. I know you're extremely busy. You've got a ton of work that you've got going on right now, so we appreciate you jumping in. So if anybody maybe doesn't know you or isn't familiar with your work, could you introduce yourself and what you do with Right on Crime? Absolutely. So I am a lifelong Oklahoman, um, fourth generation Oklahoman. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of boring. I've lived there my whole life. Um, so before college, I got involved in politics, specifically political campaigns. Never intended for it to be my career choice. Mm -hmm. um, had other things I wanted to go into. But after college, I was hired on to a political campaign and then asked to start to be a staffer for the Oklahoma Senate. And that's where my love for the policy side of politics really kind of um, sunk in. And I love digging down into all those little policy issues. So I, I went on to, to work for a large no national nonprofit, um, a few um, non smaller nonprofits in Oklahoma, and then kind of a funny story. I, I was at a job and I was like, you know, I'm just not really happy with what I'm doing. And asked a few friends like, hey, do you know any openings? And the the governor at the time, staff were like, yes, like we need someone at the Department of Corrections and no one will take the job. <laughs> and I said, that sounds awful. I'll take it. So I went in and I was like, I'm just going to work here for a few years. You know, mm -hmm. I'm going to be my sights on other things and um, ended up absolutely loving it. Mm -hmm. um, seeing a true side of the justice system and then how it affects real human beings, real Oklahomans and just developing that passion mm -hmm. for um, for working on those issues. And, and that was, you know, almost 10 years ago mm -hmm. um, and just kept working on it. Amazing. Was there like a pinpointed moment or story that you can remember where there was a switch in you that went off of, okay, this is what I'm really yeah. passionate about? Yeah, and um, you know, I have a lot of stories, mm -hmm. a lot. I'm sure. Um, <laughs> But one, you know, one that sticks out in my head, um, the very first time I was taken on a prison tour and it was at a female prison and I walked into one of the housing units and I and I stopped and they were fixing each other's hair, mm -hmm. you know, sitting on the bunk, like just chatting. And I looked at the person with me and I said, oh, my gosh, if you just change their clothes, these could all be my sorority sisters from college. Like, this is not what I expected at all, because this was around the Orange is New, New Black kind of time right. frame when it was all being released. Yeah. And so seeing, just going in there and seeing that with my eyes and hearing their stories, I was like, we have placed this label on people that are in prison um, of them being just a, everyone being a horrible person, everyone needing to be there for the rest of their lives mm -hmm. and, and not really thinking these are real human beings who probably just had really bad circumstances. Right. So. That's so interesting that you say that because I recently went on a prison tour for the first time ever. And mm -hmm. I've, you know, never been connected to anybody that's necessarily been incarcerated or had a brush with the criminal justice system. So I didn't really know what to expect. And I had I was so blown away by how many normal conversations I had there where, again, like you just said, if you took them out of that setting and, you know, took them out of the jumpsuit, it would just be like anywhere else or any yeah. other conversation. So yeah. that's fantastic. I love that story. Mm -hmm. So I want to dive in a little bit closely into Oklahoma's criminal justice system specifically. I know you oversee a few states here, but Oklahoma is really your bread and butter. Right. So <laughs> what would you say? the criminal justice system in Oklahoma does really well? So over the past several years, we have kind of addressed some of that low hanging fruit with our system. Mm -hmm. um, those things that were putting people in prison for way too long, um, or maybe certain crimes that were on the books that, that 
were kind of outdated, that we need to adjust the way that we address them. So we really dove in head first and, and did a really good job of, of removing all of that, that low hanging fruit so we could focus more on and the real detailed issues that are that are driving our prison population. Mm-hmm. So, you know, everyone always talks about the front door and the back door. So, you know, we can now focus on the front door. Why are so many people coming in and can we prevent that? If we're pushing them out the back door, what are we doing to make sure that they don't come back in um, eventually? Right. No, that's fantastic. And then when it comes to kind of the gaps and opportunities you feel like need to be filled or worked on in Oklahoma, what would you say are those pieces? So data collection is a huge thing that we need in Oklahoma. Um, We have some piecemeal data collection here and there. So we've been making decisions based on, you know, either incomplete data or no Mm -hmm. data at all. And so we really, there's an opportunity for us to increase how we are collecting data, how we're using data, Mm -hmm. so that we know when we're going and pushing a policy, the true effect it's going to have all across the system. Right. So that's one really big thing. Mm -hmm. Um, Another thing that gets preached a lot but not really a lot done um, is our, our treatment options in Oklahoma mm-hmm. and, and increasing the investment in providing more behavioral health services to people and not waiting until they're in prison, mm-hmm. um, but like cutting it off when we very first identify that they need some help. Yeah. And what would you say to somebody who maybe looks at something like providing those types of assistances and saying maybe that's you know soft on crime or a waste of taxpayer money? So, you know, we do hear that a lot. And, and I think it, it boils down to people's just misunderstanding of why some people commit crimes. Right. Some people commit crimes because they are just truly um, not great people. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, they don't have the moral compass or, or whatever, you know, and, and jails, prisons were built for those people. Mm-hmm. Some people commit crimes because there are underlying mental health or um, substance abuse issues that they're dealing with. Mm-hmm that lead to them committing that crime and and should we punish them for having these diseases because they are diseases um or should we help them overcome them you know when i would meet people in prison and they would tell me their stories you know there are some people that would tell me the way that they were raised Mm -hmm. and and it being so different from the way i was raised you know my grandmother taught me how to make a pumpkin pie Mm -hmm. this other girl told me her grandmother taught her how to make meth well, wow. when when you're 13 years old and grandma's in the kitchen teaching you how to make meth, um, you, we're not. She's not being set up for success, and the state I feel like failed her by not providing any resources for her prior to her being incarcerated. Mm-hmm. Now, after she got incarcerated, she was put into a program for women in in the Tulsa area Mm -hmm. that really helped her and changed her life. But I remember her looking at me and saying, if someone would have cared this much before, I would have never ended up in prison in the first place. Wow. So that's a really powerful testimony and just makes so much sense also in terms of recidivism rates. Yeah. So that's fantastic. And then I want to move in a little bit to your upcoming legislative session, Mm -hmm. which begins in February, I believe. So tell me a little bit about what your goals and hopes for that upcoming session looks like. Yeah. And, you know, there's not a ton of policy that we're going to be really filing or pushing with right on crime. Mm -hmm. We do have a cleanup bill with our clean slate legislation we passed a few years ago Mm -hmm. just to try and help with the implementation of that. Right. Um, we're going to be doing, obviously, some some watching of some other issues to make sure there's nowhere where we need to provide support mm-hmm. or maybe um, head off something that could potentially be bad. Mm-hmm. One of my biggest focuses is um, reframing how lawmakers look at the reforms mm-hmm. that we're working on and, and really talking about the way that we're communicating with them and helping them understand um, what's really going on in our state and why things are the way that they are. Yeah. No, that's great. And then I have a few outgoing questions that I'd love to pick your brain about. So criminal justice, while we have a lot of fun on our team, (laughs) I think that there are some times where maybe it can feel a little bit depressing and a little bit, you know, negative, I guess, in a sense. So what would make you feel optimistic that if not your state, our country is maybe at least headed in the right direction in terms of a more effective criminal justice system? And I think it's it's. Um, the changing those attitudes and our mm. feeling towards it, um, of changing the attitude of I'm mad at you, I'm going to throw you in prison towards um, 
we are sympathetic to your issues and we want to help in any way that we can. Yeah. And um, so I think that would make me feel a lot better with the way that we're going. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't like for us to treat people like they're disposable because they're not. Um, They're still human beings. And um, and you you never know, like I said, with the, the story of some of the people that I've met, you never know what's gone on before they've gotten to where they are. And, and so I think that would make me feel a little bit more optimistic mm-hmm. about where we're going. Um, I would also love to see lawmakers take a more thoughtful approach and, and less of just this knee-jerk reaction to really bad circumstances. Mm-hmm. Um, but looking at an approach that's actually going to make real change and prevent real crimes from happening and protect the citizens of Oklahoma. So, Marilyn, I know that you have a lot of experience you know, with the prison system and know a lot about that. So talk to me a little bit about, because it sounds like there was a statistic at some point where Oklahoma had like the highest incarceration rate in the nation. Can you tell me a little bit mm-hmm. about that and kind of how you guys have worked to reform that? Yeah. So at one time per capita, we had the highest incarceration rate in the world compared oh. to anyone, um, and especially with women. Now, we have been kind of going back and forth between number two and number three um, lately. Mm-hmm. We had our commutation project, which was the largest one-day um, release of people from prison ever through mm-hmm. a commutation um, that was started with Governor Mary Fallon, and then it was governor, our current governor, Governor Kevin Stitt, mm-hmm. who signed those. And, and like I said earlier, you know, really addressing some of those low-hanging fruit issues yeah. are, you know, there were crimes that we were putting people in prison for um, that maybe at one point it was appropriate to handle them that way, but now not so much. Um, so we have reclassified those as misdemeanors and that's helped reduce our prison population, helping people understand you know, the importance of alternatives to incarceration and how can we utilize those more. We've had a lot of private philanthropy put in towards these alternatives and trying to divert people from our prisons. That's helped with our numbers. Unfortunately, we're hearing that our numbers are starting to go back a a little bit. Um, If we had some better data, I could tell you exactly the cause of it. (laughs) One of the things that we, we think is causing it was because during COVID, a lot of cases were delayed and put off. Okay. So that we're starting to see those come through the system Mm -hmm. and get sentenced. Um, It could be, we did have a big, um, downfall. I don't want to say downfall. We did have a big reduction in numbers because of the commutation and reclassifying some crimes. So we might just be kind of evening out after that. Mm -hmm. We don't, we don't really know. Okay. But, um, so we are, we are looking to address that and how we can continue to keep our numbers, something that's manageable, Mm -hmm. but also, um, protecting public safety and, and looking at our crime rates. Our crime rates have dropped in Oklahoma. You hear this um, narrative that, you know, crime's up all over the country. Mm-hmm. And and in fact, crime rates have dropped. And there are some, there are, now there's some areas where crime rates have increased, but overall they've gotten lower and we're having less people booked into prison. Mm-hmm. However, the length of sentences is increasing. Okay. So is it, there's, there's no scientific data that shows a longer prison sentence is going to make um, any kind of effect on your crime rate. Mm -hmm. People who commit crimes, you know, they might know the sentence link, they might not, but that's not going to deter them from committing that crime. Sure. So I think that thoughtful ways on on handling crime, preventing crime that don't include just automatically increasing our sentences Mm -hmm. need to be explored. Yeah. And I think it'd be really easy for maybe someone to listen to this podcast and say that, you know, make making sentences shorter rather Mm -hmm. than longer is a soft on crime approach. So, which is not necessarily the case. So can you speak a little bit to how in turn that we can also be protecting victims and making sure that they see justice? Yeah. So one frustrating thing I see a lot are victims that um, they think someone's going to get a certain sentence Mm -hmm. and they actually serve another one. So I think giving victims more reassurance in knowing how long their um the person's going to be put into prison or having a better idea of how someone's going to be actually punished is a really good idea Mm. is is important also we're, we're not doing anyone any good if we are not making sure that person is released from prison prepared to go back into the community and not re-victimize someone else 
um, to make it safer for everyone else. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, I see times when a truly heinous criminal could get five years in prison. Mm -hmm. And someone who maybe um, committed a property crime gets 20. So where are we safer? Are we safer with that truly heinous person out in the community or the property crime person out in the community? And and that's very frustrating to me, um, especially, you know, looking at when, when victims are, are victimized, they expect to see justice. And, and mm-hmm. then that's not justice. And I also like to tell people, like, at Ride on Crime, we really truly do care about victims because mm-hmm. most of us have actually been victims of crime yeah. or have family members who've been victims of crime. So it's really important for us to get it right mm-hmm. because we want those victims to have some comfort and knowing the system is going to work the way that it should. Yeah, that's such a smart approach to all of it. Uh, And it makes so much sense, especially when you put it in the sense of someone gets out of prison, Mm -hmm. because most of all, mostly they are going to get out of prison at some point. So making sure that they are going to be in society and not re-victimize people. So on a little bit of an offhand tangent, I want to talk a little bit about clean slate laws, because I feel like that's something you know a lot about. So can you tell us a little bit about what that means and what the value is there. So a few years ago, Oklahoma passed what is called the Clean Slate Law in the state of Oklahoma, which automates the expungement of records for someone. It didn't change who qualifies. Um, It didn't change really much of of the process um, in general. It just took it from a paper-based process to a computer-based process, which puts people through much quicker. It also, there are people who maybe didn't realize that they qualify for an expungement who will be put through. It saves people money because right now with the paper process, um, you have to hire an attorney, go through all these steps, um, and it can get very costly. So for those that it was cost prohibitive, this will help them out as well. And and we're putting more people out there that are eligible for jobs in Oklahoma, Mm -hmm. which I like. Um, We're changing generational changes to, to families of someone that that has more opportunities, um, especially as far as like where they go live and and things like that. So it was really important changes. Um, We were really fortunate to have Representative Nicole Miller and Senator Adam Pugh um, take on those efforts with us. This year, we're actually filing additional language to that. Um, We've been working with um, the OSBI, the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation, Mm -hmm. on the implementation plan for that. And, at, and seeing where there's some barriers that we didn't think about the first round. So we do have language that's going to to help simplify it, um, clarify some things before it actually gets fully implemented for the community. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And then maybe for someone who's watching this and is very passionate about criminal mm-hmm. justice, but maybe isn't in the legislature or doesn't work for yeah. a right on crime, how would you recommend that somebody get involved, join the fight in making our criminal justice system better and more fair? Yeah, there's tons of groups working in the state of Oklahoma um, on these types of issues. Mm-hmm. Um, Right on Crime, we have our website you can go to. My contact information is on there. Um, So they can certainly, like, you know, get in touch with our organizations, organization. And and if there's not a way that I can directly plug them in, like like I said, there's so many other groups working on issues that Mm -hmm. I guarantee you I can find somewhere to to direct you towards and get you plugged into what's going on. That's so great because I know you're really busy, but (laughs) we're a very reachable team here because we really care about the issues that we're fighting for. And then my last question is if people want to keep up with you and the work that you're doing in Oklahoma and for Right on Crime, where can they find you? So I'm on Twitter X. What are we calling it now? (laughs) (laughs) I'm still saying Twitter firmly, but (laughs) formally referred to as Twitter um, at Marilyn Davidson. Um, I try and and post a lot of policy Mm -hmm. updates and issues on there during session, um, more so than any other tool that I use. Yeah, that's great. Well, Marilyn, thank you so much for taking time to join us today. We're so glad you're here in the great state of Texas. I'm sure you can't wait to get home, but we're happy that you were here. Well, thank you for having me. Absolutely. And thank you guys so much for joining us at the Right on Crime podcast. To find out more about these issues, you can visit our website at rightoncrime.com. Until then, see you next time.